Chapter 1, The Fox Girl. In the vast, deserted wilderness, not a soul could be seen. At a glance, the landscape was covered in a dull yellow, scattered with wild grass and irregular gray-white stones of various sizes. The scorching sun hung high, baking the earth and filling the air with swirling yellow dust. Amidst the murky yellow expanse, a frail and petite figure gradually became distinct, running determinately forward. She was a girl about six or seven years old, dressed in a pale yellow robe embroidered with light pink plum blossoms, her black hair done up in twin buns, her large expressive eyes dark and shiny. Below her delicate little nose, her small mouth was a bright red, making her whole delicate face appear beautifully clear and bright. In her right hand, she clutched a palm-sized pellet drum. The drum seemed old, its surfaces slightly yellowed, adorned with patterns of green snakes. The beads connected to the drumsticks flipped up and down, occasionally striking the drum, producing a few light sounds. Despite her young age, she moved with agility. After a few bounds, she reached a clearing surrounded by tall weeds. Perhaps from running too hastily, beads of sweat covered her pale forehead, with one trail of sweat running down her left cheek, dripping into the tender neck below. She wiped her face with her left hand. Her round cheeks were flushed red like ripe apples, yet she didn't slow her pace. Demon, where do you think you're running? Just then, a harsh shout from a man suddenly came from behind. Startled by the sound, the girl's face turned pale in an instant. Lifting the drum in her right hand, she spun it forcefully, her lips moving slightly. A faint blue light emanated from the drum as the beads struck it casting a blue light onto a clump of weeds in front of her. The surface of the weeds briefly shone with a blue light, but it flickered out as if nothing had happened. She quickly rotated her hand several times, and streaks of blue light shot out with each strike of the drum's beads, casting waves of blue light onto the surrounding weeds. After finishing these actions, the girl's complexion turned even paler, but she didn't pause to rest and hurriedly dived into the weeds in front of her. Not long after she disappeared into the weeds, a figure swiftly arrived, kicking up a cloud of dust a dozen yards behind, appearing before the patch of tall weeds. The figure was a man in his forties, with a bushy beard, tall and burly, carrying a gleaming broad knife in one hand. His appearance fierce and menacing. His gaze fell on the delicate footprints left in front of the weeds, and he moved to charge forward with his knife raised. But at that moment, under a flurry of blue light from the bushes, several blue snakes shot out, their mouths wide open, viciously biting at the bearded man. Caught off guard, the bearded man quickly slapped a talisman on himself, summoning a white light shield, and with a flick of his right arm, the broad knife vibrated loudly as he slashed forward. With a hiss, a chilly light several feet long shot out from the knife, cutting through three of the blue snakes, splitting them in two followed by a couple of thuds as the remaining two were also repelled by the light shield and chopped in half by another sweep of the blade. The blue snakes, revealed to be transformed from clumps of green weeds, were swiftly defeated by the bearded man. He grunted, intending to continue his pursuit into the bushes, but then paused, sensing something and stood still. The rustling of footsteps approached, and two figures arrived. One was a thin, tall young Taoist priest in a somewhat tattered grey robe, holding a horsehair whisk, and the other was a short, sturdy man with a horse-like face, several bruises on his face and dishevelled hair. Are you two all right? The bearded man turned back to ask. This demon is truly cunning, just like a fox spirit's daughter. We were too hasty in our pursuit and fell for her tricks, but it's nothing serious. But Yen, why have you stopped here? Where is the demon now? The horse-faced man asked, waving his hand in confusion. The bearded man didn't respond but pointed to the tall weeds ahead, where the delicate footprints were still visible. What are we waiting for? Let's seize her in one fell swoop, the horse-faced man said upon seeing this. This demon has been fleeing for a day and a night. She might be reaching her limit. But she is skilled in using wood-based illusions and in these weeds, she's like a fish in water. It's risky to chase her blindly, the Taoist priest squinted, suggesting caution. Should we just let her escape? Such a young demon is already so cunning. If she grows up, she will be a calamity to the people, 
the horse-faced man hesitated but stopped moving unwillingly. We, as righteous cultivators, have a duty to eliminate demons and subdue devils. Since we three have found this fox spirit, we will not let her escape again, the bearded man said with righteous fervor. Yen, it seems you have a plan, the Taoist priest glanced at the bearded man inquiring. This patch of weeds is large. If we three chase blindly, although we would eventually capture her, it would take a lot of effort. I heard that Fong recently acquired a fire cloud talisman, and your wind drawing technique is highly proficient. Combined, we could clear these weeds in no time, leaving the demon nowhere to hide, the bearded man explained slowly. A fire cloud talisman. It's possible. But after we catch the fox spirit, the fur is mine and I want nothing else, the horse-faced man pondered for a moment before saying. No, we must capture this fox spirit alive, the bearded man shook his head firmly, rejecting the offer. What do you mean, Yen? This fire cloud talisman is a mid-level item, and it cost me a lot, the horse-faced man's tone chilled suddenly. Calm down, Fong. If I'm not mistaken, Yen is a disciple of the Bloodblade Society's outer sect. There was a mission issued recently in the society, and capturing this fox spirit alive not only allows you to become an inner sect disciple but also grants you a blood rebuke pill and a thousand spirit stones as a reward. The Taoist priest looked meaningfully at the bearded man, hinting at his understanding. Chi, you are well informed. Let's be frank then. If you two help me capture this fox spirit alive, I will split all the spirit stones equally between you, the bearded man stated bluntly. Since Yen has spoken, I have no objections. The Taoist priest casually draped the whisk over his arm. Then let's not delay. Let's do it, the horse-faced man said, taking out a talisman from his bosom with a pained look, then tossing it forward while chanting. The talisman immediately emitted a layer of red light, then exploded into a burst of fiery red flames, like a cloud of fire, pressing down on the weeds below. Whoosh! The tall weeds touched by the fire cloud immediately burst into fierce flames. Seeing this, the Taoist priest exclaimed, Infinite heavenly venerate! and suddenly swung his whisk outward. In an instant, whooshing sounds filled the air as several gusts of white misty wind appeared out of nowhere, spreading outwards in a fan shape. The wind aided the fire, and the fire borrowed the wind's strength, spreading rapidly through the weeds like a tempestuous wave, with black smoke billowing and grass ash flying everywhere. The three men fixed their gaze on the firestorm ahead, not blinking. There! Suddenly, the Taoist priest shouted, his body shooting forward like an arrow toward a specific spot, his whisk vibrating with a faint blue light. The bearded man and the horse-faced man, hearing this, were immediately invigorated and rushed after the Taoist priest. They saw a small figure suddenly dart out from the burning weeds about twenty to thirty yards ahead, clearly the girl who had previously escaped into the weeds. But now, her pale yellow robe was torn in several places, and her fair face was blackened by the smoke. She had hidden in this large area of weeds, carefully changing her direction to avoid making noise. Thinking she could relax when no sound followed, she hadn't expected the men to use fire to force her out. Her small face tightened, full of panic, and without a word, she ran forward desperately, choosing her path in a panic, coughing continuously. Before she could get far, she felt a chill wind from behind, and a dense mass of black hair appeared, swirling toward her back. Almost at the same time, a sizzling sound came from above her head, and a black net about a yard wide fell down. The girl's eyes showed despair, but then her gaze fell on a slightly withered small tree about a dozen yards ahead. Her eyes lighting up slightly as she bit her tongue hard. Got you! The horse-faced man was the slowest, but seeing the girl trapped by the combined efforts of the bearded man and the Taoist priest, his face broke into a wide smile. A large swath of black hair swept forward several yards, tightly binding the girl, while the black net above also fell down. But just then the girl's figure, unable to move, flashed with a blue light and dissolved, transforming into a withered small tree. A large swath of black hair swept forward several yards, tightly binding the girl, while the black net above also fell down. But just then the girl's figure, unable to move, 
flashed with a blue light and dissolved, transforming into a withered small tree. Would escape! The bearded man and the Taoist priest landed, staring at the transformation before them, their expressions darkening. There! The horse-faced man quickly pointed to a spot not far ahead, where a withered small tree had just blurred. It transformed into a girl holding a pellet drum, who glanced back before turning and fleeing forward. Chase! Perhaps due to the exertion from using the wood escape technique, the girl's face was completely drained of color, and her steps became unsteady, her speed greatly reduced, quickly closing the gap between her and the three men. Ouch! The girl suddenly cried out in surprise, tripped by a stone underfoot, and fell forward, slamming into a large gray-white boulder about a yard high in front of her, and fell heavily to the ground. Keep running! The three men saw this and slowed their pace, gradually closing in on the girl, forming a triangular encirclement, the horse-faced man even licking his lips and ominously saying. After chasing her for almost a day and a night, eating several losses along the way, they naturally felt some resentment, especially the horse-faced man, who had even sacrificed a fire-cloud talisman. The girl's small body was already delicate and exquisite, and now, as the three men closed in step by step, she curled up even tighter against the boulder behind her, but her eyes were filled with a resentful expression. Seeing the expression on the girl's face, the three men didn't take it to heart. Instead, the horse-faced man stepped forward, raising a hand and saying darkly, Although I can't kill you, today I will teach you a good lesson, you demon. Just then, something unexpected happened. With a crack, the surface of the large boulder the girl was leaning against suddenly cracked with numerous fine lines, and small stones began to roll down, falling on the girl's hair, causing her to shiver. Eh! The horse-faced man made a slight sound of surprise. His raised hand hanging in mid-air, the bearded man and the other's attention momentarily shifting from the girl to the boulder behind her. Crack! As the bearded man and the others watched, the surface of the boulder spread cracks like a spider web, with many stone chips peeling off and falling to the ground. Ah! The girl, too, hadn't expected the boulder behind her to show such anomalies, and scared, she closed her eyes, hugging her head, not daring to move. With a boom, the boulder finally shattered into pieces with a loud noise, large chunks of stone scattering in all directions, kicking up a cloud of yellow dust. The three men were startled, their faces showing alarm as they stepped back a few steps, but their eyes still fixed on the direction of the boulder. What, what is this? The horse-faced man's face changed, somewhat astonished. Through the settling dust, it was clear that the original boulder was no longer there, replaced instead by an exceptionally tall man's figure. This man was dressed in a green robe, his hair and face covered in a layer of grayish lime, as if he had been inside the boulder before. His features ordinary, his skin slightly dark, his eyes staring straight ahead, appearing somewhat wooden and slow, but he was taller than the bearded man by a head. This sudden turn of events left the girl and the three men all staring in dumbfounded amazement. Chapter 2 Big Brother Stone Big Brother Stone As the three burly men were still somewhat stunned, a surprisingly crisp and joyful voice suddenly rang out. Unbeknownst to them, the girl had already scrambled up and was hugging the tall young man who had just emerged from the boulder. Small and delicate, the girl only reached the waist of the tall young man. She was clutching his thighs tightly with her small, pale hands, mostly hiding behind him. Her big watery eyes looked up at him, spinning ceaselessly. Hearing her call out, the three men were taken aback once again, exchanging glances before their eyes settled back on the tall young man. Upon hearing the girl's cries, his face remained expressionless, still staring blankly ahead, which made the three men grow suspicious. The girl's heart tightened. She shook the hands gripping the young man's thighs and called out loudly and tearfully. Big Brother Stone, you has finally found you. These bad people are trying to catch you. Help me fight them, Big Brother Stone. This time, the tall young man seemed to hear the girl's call. His head slowly lowered a bit. The girl looked up into the young man's eyes only to find them empty, which made her heart skip a beat. However, this scene made the three men uneasy. They had already scanned the tall young man with their spiritual sense and found no trace of magical power on him. 
There were two possibilities for this. Either he truly was a mere mortal without any magical prowess, or he possessed some special secret technique or magical item that concealed his powers. Given the strange circumstances of the young man's appearance and the girl's consistent cries of Big Brother Stone, the three men suspected the latter and feared he might even be a demon. The Taoist priest rested his whisk on his arm, his eyes shifting back and forth between the tall young man and the girl, his pupils spinning wildly, pondering the situation. The horse-faced man had already retracted his hand and unknowingly stepped back, joining the bearded man and the Taoist priest. His left hand, hidden in his sleeve, clenched something tightly, his gaze fixed on the girl. May I ask who you are? I am Yen Cheng from the Bloodblade Society, working with two fellow Taoists to capture this demon fox. If you are unrelated to this matter, please leave, the bearded man said with a probing tone after signaling his companions with his eyes. Upon hearing this, the girl looked at the tall young man with pleading eyes. The tall young man slowly raised his head, giving the bearded man a wooden glance without a word. The bearded man's eyes flickered with annoyance, but he didn't lash out and instead repeated his words, raising his voice a bit. The girl opened her mouth slightly but said nothing. However, the small hands gripping the young man's pants began to sweat profusely, making her palms damp. The tall young man still showed no reaction. This person is so suspicious. There must be a problem. Instead of wasting time here, we should. The horse-faced man whispered to his companions. In all the lands within ten thousand miles, hearing the name of the Bloodblade Society and still remaining so calm, this person must either have an extraordinary cultivation level or he is truly a fool. Regardless, he first protected a demon, so killing him would bring no objections. Of course how to proceed I leave to you, friend Yen, the Taoist priest said with a squint, communicating silently to the others. If you disrespect us three like this, the bearded man nodded slightly, his eyes growing colder as he weighed the broad knife in his hand and suddenly shouted. His shout echoed loudly across the wilderness, making the air buzz. Hearing this, the girl's face showed fear, and she unconsciously let go of the young man's pant leg, clutching her pellet drum tightly. The tall young man seemed deaf to the bearded man's words, still unresponsive. Fine, since you insist on siding with that demon girl, then, take action. The bearded man's eyes flashed viciously as he suddenly raised his broad knife, which shone with a piercing white light, blinding to look at, and raised his other hand. A black light flashed and disappeared in the air, turning into a large black net that swooped down. The girl gasped in alarm and hurriedly stepped back, but it was too late due to the closeness. The net, like a dark cloud, pressed down fiercely and closed, trapping her and the tall young man together. Inside the net, a cold light emerged, and each knot of the rope showed a silver curved hook, gleaming sharply. The girl screamed, spraying a mist of blood onto her pellet drum, simultaneously twisting her wrist. Thud! The crisp sound of the pellet drum rang out. The girl's body shone with a green light, her figure blurred and then dispersed, turning into a piece of dead wood. Thump! Ten yards away, the girl's figure reappeared and then fell to the ground, her limbs wounded by the net's barbs, bleeding profusely from a dozen cuts. She struggled to get up but only took one step before collapsing again, her face pale and gasping for air. At this moment, the bearded man didn't look at the helpless girl anymore. Instead, he formed a hand seal, and the black net wrapped around the tall young man suddenly tightened. At the same time, the sound of breaking air began, and the Taoist priest leaped into the air, flicking his wrist, and more than ten green lights shot out, which were actually crystal-clear flying needles shooting towards the young man's body from all directions. Be careful! Although the girl couldn't stand up, seeing this, she could only scream again. Ping ping ping! A metallic clashing sound erupted as the green needles struck the tall young man's body, all deflecting off as if they had hit stone. How is this possible? The Taoist priest, lightly landing, exclaimed in disbelief. Even if the opponent were a block of stone, these flying needles should have easily penetrated it. Whoosh! A streak of golden light suddenly flew out from beside the Taoist priest, swiftly and solidly nailing itself to the young man's throat. Hee hee! 
hit by my golden bee dart, he won't survive. The horse-faced man began to laugh coldly, lowering his raised arm. But before he could finish with a boom, the dart nailed in the young man's throat spontaneously exploded, scattering into bits of golden light. This can't be. The horse-faced man's face looked as if he had seen a ghost. The bearded man also stared at the tall young man in disbelief. The hooks in the black net, capable of tearing through iron, hung from the young man's body but couldn't penetrate his skin at all. As the three men were shocked, the young man, under the continuous attacks, finally reacted. He slowly lowered his head, looked at the things hanging on him, and seemed to find them bothersome. His arms moved, and his fingers simultaneously grabbed the black net wrapped around his body. Crack. After a burst of spiritual light on the surface of the black net, it tore apart like paper, falling lightly to the ground in two pieces. The horse-faced man and the Taoist priest's eyes nearly popped out. Not far away, the girl also opened her mouth wide, forgetting the pain she was in. You! You dare destroy my magical instrument! The bearded man witnessed this scene and roared, his heart bleeding. This black net was a valuable item he had borrowed at great expense from a friend within the society, and its inexplicable destruction here made him furious. The bearded man gritted his teeth at the tall young man, pinched a purple talisman between his fingers, and threw it into the air while chanting a spell. The talisman immediately flew out, hovering over the young man's head. Puff! The talisman shattered, turning into a dense black lead cloud. Accompanied by the sound of thunder, a flash of light from the black cloud, a thick silver arc of electricity shot down. Boom! The thick electric arc struck the young man directly, scattering numerous arcs around, striking the ground and creating a series of shocking black pits. The girl, scared by the thunder, closed her eyes, not knowing where she found the strength to push herself back a few steps, narrowly avoiding several aftershocks of the lightning. But when she nervously opened her eyes again, her mouth opened and closed, nearly biting her tongue. The tall young man stood quietly on the pitted ground, his body completely unscathed. Although the bearded man was shocked, he didn't stop his actions, quickly chanting and forming a spell with his hands. Bind! Another silver arc fell from the sky and suddenly changed, interweaving into chains of lightning that swiftly wrapped around the tall young man, binding him tightly. Now is the time, fellow Taoists. The bearded man roared, crossing his broad knife in front of him, a red light emerging from the object in his hand as he leaped forward, slashing fiercely at the tall young man's face. The horse-faced man, initially shocked by the young man's resistance to the lightning, cheered at the sight, forming a hand seal, his body suddenly turning into a light breeze and disappearing from the spot. In the next moment, next to the tall young man, a whirlwind appeared, and the horse-faced man emerged from it, wielding a black iron ruler in his hand, its surface flickering with white runes, and struck the young man's shoulder with a malicious wind. The Taoist priest's eyes flickered, not following the other two but stepping back two steps and waving his hand. A burst of blood light flew from his sleeve, circling swiftly in the air with a thunderous speed and silently struck the tall young man's back of the head. Although the three men attacked at different times, their coordination was impeccable, evidently not their first time working together. The tall young man remained still, appearing completely oblivious to the attacks before him. Seeing this, a look of joy flashed in the bearded man's eyes, and he put even more force into the slash he was delivering. But in the next moment, he suddenly felt a tight grip on his wrist, caught by a hand as firm as cast iron. Not only could his knife no longer descend an inch, but his forward charge also came to a screeching halt. Unexpectedly, the tall young man had reached out an arm. His fingers hooked to grab the wrist of the bearded man's knife hand with such speed it was nearly invisible. The bearded man tried to pull back with all his might, but it was as if the young man's arm was rooted firmly in place, unmovable, sending a chill down his spine, yet a cruel smile quickly appeared on his face. Bang! Puff! The horse-faced man's iron ruler and the Taoist priest's bloodlight orb hit the tall young man's shoulder and the back of his head almost simultaneously. One burst into blinding black light, the other shattered like porcelain, 
enveloping the young man's head in a thick blood mist, emitting a nauseating stench. Ah! The horse-faced man burst into laughter, but the next moment, he felt a burning sensation in his fingers, a tremendous force like an angry wave, erupted from the tall young man's body, traveling up the iron ruler to reach him. No. The horse-faced man's face showed terror, and before he could say more, his body involuntarily flew backward, crashing to the ground far away, accompanied by a series of cracking sounds within his body. His bones shattered, and blood mixed with fragments of his organs spurted from his mouth. His body lay like a perforated sack lifeless. Impossible you. Ah. The bearded man was shocked, but before he could take any action, the fingers gripping his wrist vibrated strangely, causing an immediate and excruciating fracturing of his bones throughout his body. The intense pain was like being flayed, eliciting a piercing scream from the bearded man. Whoosh! Without warning, the bearded man was flung into the air and violently thrown against a nearby boulder. Boom! As the bearded man screamed, his body exploded on impact with the boulder, turning into a mass of flesh and blood. This series of actions was lightning fast, happening in just an instant. The Taoist priest, after witnessing everything, paled dramatically. He spun around and, while slapping several colorful talismans on himself, began to sprint back the way he came. But he had only taken a few steps when he felt the air around him tighten. The protective lights around his body flickered out, and then his body burst like a toy under an invisible giant squeeze, turning into a shower of blood and flesh scattering in the air. Whoosh! The thick blood mist enveloping the tall young man's head was sucked into his mouth, strand by strand, revealing his wooden expression once again. Chapter 3. Departing. The young girl stared blankly at everything unfolding before her, her mouth half open, seemingly still in shock from the recent events. She gazed dully at the mutilated corpses of the three burly men, her body slumping to the ground as tears streamed down her face. At first, she sobbed quietly, as if recalling some painful memory, but soon her crying grew louder. Her wails, bursting forth like a breached river, shattered the silence of the wasteland, sounding like a mournful song that tugged at the heartstrings, beseeching the heavens about the world's hardships and injustices. After some time, her crying abruptly stopped. The girl stood up again, her fists clenched, her face cleaned of grime and blood by her tears, revealing a delicate and pretty face once more, but her eyes seemed to hold something new. Suddenly, she ran toward a large grey-white boulder not far ahead. Under the boulder lay a blurred, bloody corpse, barely recognizable as the bearded man, dead and several yards from the boulder. Nearby lay a muddied, diminutive body, likely the horse-faced man from earlier. As for the Taoist priest, he had been obliterated by a punch from the tall young man, leaving no trace of his body, only bits of flesh and bloodstains nearby. The girl leapt to the boulder, her fingers suddenly extending several inches into sharp green claws, which she furiously swung at the bearded man's remains. Swooshing sounds filled the air as green claw streaks lashed out, striking the body and splattering blood. In the blink of an eye, the already mutilated corpse was torn into pieces. Still unsatisfied, she opened her mouth and spewed a stream of green flame, reducing the remnants to ashes. She then did the same to the horse-faced man's body before finally stopping. After all this, the girl collapsed to the ground again, panting heavily. The little magic she had recovered was spent once more. Dad, Mom, Big Brother, Second Sister. The villains of the Bloodblade Society are finally dead, though not by my own hand. But your great vengeance has been somewhat avenged. Rest assured as long as I live. One day I will ascend Blood Fong Mountain and eradicate the Bloodblade Society from this world. The girl calmed her emotions and knelt down, murmuring to herself. After saying this, her eyes reddened again, on the verge of tears, but she forcefully held them back. Don't cry, she said, recalling her father's words. Those who cry often don't grow up. I need to grow up fast. After a while, she managed to suppress her urge to cry and stood up glancing at the storage bags left by the three men on the ground. 
She looked disgusted but hesitated only a moment before picking everything up and stowing it away. As the sun moved westward, the sky darkened, and the wind grew stronger, howling as the temperature dropped. Looking around at the vast, lonely landscape, the girl felt a wave of fear and instinctively huddled closer to the only other living person, the tall young man. After delivering that punch, the tall young man had reverted to his previous dazed state, standing still and looking down at his feet, seemingly oblivious to the girl's recent actions. This big brother stone. The girl hesitated, calling out softly. The tall young man did not respond. Big brother stone, my name is Lu Yuer. Thank you for killing those three men earlier. Although you are also a human, my dad said there are good people among humans, the girl said timidly. The young man's body twitched slightly, finally showing some response as he looked up at Lu Yuer. His pupils reflected her figure, and a flicker of light seemed to pass through his vacant eyes, then dimmed again, though he continued to watch her. This startled Lu Yuer, causing her to step back. However, the young man just stared blankly at her without moving. Lu Yuer breathed a sigh of relief, growing more convinced of the young man's mental absence, and her courage gradually returned. She approached again, curiously examining him. In the chaos earlier, she hadn't taken a close look, but now, seeing him up close, she noted more details. The young man was tall, with long fingers and not overly muscular, yet he exuded a sense of immense strength. His eyes were vacant, but his pupils were intensely dark, as if they could suck in one's soul. His exposed skin was dark and smooth, showing no signs of injury from the recent battle. His clothes were simple and had withstood lightning and sword cuts without damage. All this, coupled with his earlier inhalation of the unusual blood mist, confirmed that he was no ordinary human, and certainly not a mortal. How could a mortal have slain three magic-wielding cultivators so quickly? Lu Yuer stared at the tall young man, who still showed no reaction, and her mood gradually relaxed. Perhaps due to the relief after surviving a disaster, she playfully circled around him. His eyes followed Lu Yuer, as if something about her intrigued him. Maybe because his presence had saved her from calamity and helped her avenge her enemies, the girl felt increasingly fond of the tall young man. Eh! Lu Yuer suddenly exclaimed softly, noticing a small, translucent green ornament peeking from the young man's chest, curious but hesitant to lift his clothes for a closer look. Just then, the wind intensified, and the sky clouded over rapidly, darkening as thunderclouds rolled in. Boom! A thick bolt of lightning tore through the clouds, illuminating half the sky with a tremendous roar, and rain poured down heavily. Ah! Lu Yuer cried out, instinctively taking shelter under the tall young man, clinging to his legs as her small body trembled. Being a fox spirit, she had an innate fear of natural thunder. A glint of awareness flickered in the young man's eyes, but it soon faded. Whether intentionally or not, he bent slightly, his tall frame sheltering Lu Yuer from the relentless storm. A warmth surged in the girl's heart, and she no longer feared the storm outside, feeling a peace reminiscent of the safety of her father's arms. The storm was brief, and soon the air cleared, carrying the fresh scent of grass and earth. Lu Yuer shook off the rainwater, giggling, and pulled up the young man's hand to flick water droplets from his clothes. His clothes, made of some unknown material, repelled the water like lotus leaves, beating up without soaking in. The young man remained passive to Lu Yuer's actions, neither resisting nor responding. By the way, Big Brother Stone, I still don't know your name, Lu Yuer said, trying to make him sit. The young man obediently sat down but remained silent. Big Brother Stone, why were you here? That punch was really powerful. Can you teach me? Big Brother Stone. Lu Yuer tried various ways to engage him in conversation, but no matter what she said, the young man gave no response, leading her to feel disappointed again. Big Brother Stone, I don't know who you are, but since you killed the people from the Bloodblade Society, let's leave here together, the girl decided after some thought, grabbing the young man's large hand and pleading. Although he seemed lost, the young man seemed to understand after Lu Yuer's explanations and gestures. After blinking, 
He finally followed her slowly. Dusk fell, the sun like spilt blood. The vast wasteland bathed in the afterglow, turning somewhat golden. The figures of the tall young man and the small girl receded into the distance toward the setting sun, their voices barely audible in the wind. Big Brother Stone, I know you're very powerful, but there are still many bad people in the Bloodblade Society. It's getting late, you must be hungry. Once we leave here, I'll catch some wild birds and roast them for you. I'm pretty good at cooking. Big Brother Stone, from now on, I'll treat you like my real brother. Chapter 4 Dependence. In a lush and expansive wilderness forest, the harsh cold wind howls continuously, and heavy snow falls in flurries, obscuring everything in white. Although the sun has not yet fully set, the forest under the blanket of snow appears very dim. A barely discernible forest path winds and twists, nearly indistinguishable under the thick layer of snow, but at its far end, a flicker of light glows, offering a hint of warmth in the icy, snowy world. This light comes from the only mountain temple within a thousand miles of this forest. Due to its remote location, this temple has long lost its patrons and has been abandoned for many years. The outer gate and walls have collapsed, leaving only a dilapidated main hall standing desolately in place. The temple's doors are long gone, replaced by a tattered straw mat that hangs partially across the doorway, crudely shielding the interior from the wind and snow. Through the holes in the straw mat, one can see inside the empty hall, filled with scattered debris and straw, and a figure seated cross-legged in the center. It is a tall young man in blue clothes, who, even seated, appears unusually upright. However, his face is utterly expressionless, wooden to the extreme, much like the broken clay statue of the god behind him, rigid, dull, lifeless. The young man holds his arms in front of his chest, and nestled between his arms is a petite, slender girl, the young fox spirit Lu Yuer. Ah! Uh -huh. Suddenly, a low moan comes from the young man's embrace. Lu Yuer nuzzles her small head against the young man's arm, moving her face a bit outward from where it had been buried against his chest, peeking out between his arms. Her originally delicate and pretty face is now flushed with a sickly red, clearly still asleep yet her finely arched eyebrows are tightly furrowed, and her eyes move restlessly under her closed lids, as if she is experiencing a terrible nightmare. No! Don't, Ugh! Accompanied by a series of mumbled words from her dream, Lu Yuer's arms, which are wrapped around the young man's arm, unconsciously tighten. Her leg, too, kicks out restlessly from his embrace, and her body twitches occasionally. The little face that had shifted outward now buries itself back against the young man's chest. The young man, who had been staring straight ahead, seems to sense something and lowers his head to look at the girl in his arms. His wooden gaze softens slightly, showing a hint of confusion, but mostly remains vacant. Stone. Brother. Another series of indistinct dream words buzz from the embrace, barely audible. Perhaps it's the reflection of the firelight but the young man's face seems a bit softer now, and his usually empty eyes appear slightly brighter. He does not stand up. Instead, he shuffles his position on the ground, using half of his body to block the cold wind that leaks in. He slightly adjusts his arms, pulling back the girl's leg into his embrace and tightening his hold a little. The girl nestles against him a few times, then gradually settles down, her breathing evening out. Outside the hall, the sky has already turned pitch black, and the wild snowstorm, too, has subtly lessened without notice. Halfway up a hundred-meter-tall lush mountain, at a cave entrance over three meters high, a tall young man stands with his back to the entrance, towering and still. Lu Yuer stands behind the young man, one hand clutching the hem of his clothes, the other holding his leg, her face peeking forward, slightly pale with nervousness. But a few meters in front of them, a giant gray bear, as tall as two adults, stands on its hind legs. Its head sports a fierce, bone-like horn, and its gaping mouth reveals sharp, chilling teeth, dripping with foul-smelling saliva as it growls menacingly. The tall young man, who appears childlike in his vulnerability compared to the massive bear, shows no expression, just staring straight at the bear. His eyes as dark as ink, lacking any luster. The bear, after a tense standoff, 
suddenly shows a trace of almost human-like fear, roars abruptly, and steps back before turning and fleeing on all fours. Lu Yue, seeing this, first relaxes, letting out a breath of relief, then scratches her head in confusion. She moves in front of the young man, looking up at him. She stares at his wooden face for a long while but can't discern any abnormality, showing a hint of disappointment. Stone brother, Lu Yue knows you are not ordinary, but it's a pity you don't speak. It would be nice if you could talk with me, ah. Lu Yue sighs like an adult, taking the young man's large hand and walking back toward the cave in the mountainside. The young man remains silent, but his eyes briefly follow the small, pale hand pulling him, and he slowly enters the cave as she leads. On an unnamed vast plain during the lush spring, when grass shoots are just beginning to sprout, the air is filled with a fresh scent of green grass. A girl around eight or nine years old, holding a cluster of slender vines adorned with pale yellow flowers, rides on the shoulders of a tall young man, walking leisurely. Compared to two years ago, the young man has not changed at all, still wearing the same blue clothes, but Lu Yue has grown significantly. The girl has grown taller, her face losing some of its childishness, showing a hint of the allure rare in ordinary girls, clearly destined to be a great beauty, perhaps even a nation's downfall. She swiftly weaves the yellow flower vines in her hands, humming a light and cheerful tune. Her voice clear and melodious, like the song of a warbler. It's done. Before the song ends, Lu Yue stops her hands, a beautifully tight flower crown formed. She holds the crown, turning it around to inspect it, nods in satisfaction, and joyfully places it precisely on the young man's head. The crown fits perfectly, the densest part of the flowers resting just above his forehead. The young man seems to feel it, touches the crown lightly with his hand, then slowly withdraws his touch. Lu Yue, accustomed to the young man's reactions, glances down at the green cord around his neck, covers her mouth with a giggle, and playfully reaches to pull at the cord, pretending to lift it. But the young man, as if instinctively, reaches for his chest, grabbing the dark green ornament tied to the end of the cord, refusing to let go. Stone brother, you're such a miser, always like this. I'm just curious and want to see. Lu Yue puffs up her cheeks. Though she speaks in this way, she isn't truly upset. In the past two years, Stone Brother has never spoken to her, rarely reacting to the outside world, except when it involves the ornament he holds, which always prompts a reaction. For this reason, Lu Yue occasionally teases him with it. Time flies swiftly, and several years pass in a blink. A pretty girl in her early teens, dressed in a white tunic and skirt, with long black hair reaching her waist, walks along a sandy path with her hands clasped behind her back, wearing light lotus-colored boots. Behind her follows a tall man in blue, expressionless, walking slowly. The two walk at different paces, one fast, one slow, but they don't drift far apart. Ahead, Lu Yue sees a majestic city with a greenish hue at the end of the road, bustling with tiny figures moving in and out of the city gates. She frowns slightly and stops. Ming! Yuan City. Lu Yue squints for a while, then slowly pronounces. The tall young man reaches her side and stops as well, looking toward the city like her. It looks like a large human city. Liu Yue er more more softly, unser time. In the past five years, to cure the young man's affliction, they have entered several human towns, but they have never approached a city of this scale before. Stone brother, if you were fully recovered, could you help Lu Yue take revenge? She asks, looking up at him, though unsure if she's asking him or herself. The young man seems to react, his gaze returning from the distance to look at the girl. Yet he remains silent. What am I talking about, even if Stone Brother is powerful? How could he possibly defeat so many bad people from the Bloodblade Society? Lu Yue seems to remember something, her expression darkening as she lowers her head, tears falling and sinking into the sandy ground. At that moment, she suddenly feels a weight on her head, a warm touch. She looks up slightly and sees her stone brother, gently stroking her head, his eyes unusually soft. For some reason, Lu Yue feels incredibly reassured at this moment, a surge of courage welling up within her, as if no hardship could frighten her anymore. 
She wipes the tears from her face with the back of her hand, takes the young man's thick hand with a determined look, and starts walking towards the distant city gate. Chapter 5 Beastly Horse Mingyuan City, the third largest city within the borders of the prosperous kingdom. Located on the plains and covering an area of a hundred miles, the city is situated south of a large river that winds and meanders, providing convenient transportation by both water and land, which has contributed to the city's prosperity. At this moment, the crowd at the city gate forms a long queue, buzzing with noise. Lu Yue, holding the tall young man's hand, mixes in with the crowd, feeling somewhat apprehensive as she occasionally glances up at the city gate several meters high. There hangs an octagonal bronze mirror facing the direction of the city gate. At this hour, with the sun well up, the mirror's engraved bagua patterns shimmer under the sunlight, radiating a majestic aura. To enter the city, one only needs to pay some silver to the guards. The inspection seems lax, and soon it is Lu Yue and the young man's turn. As they stand under the city gate, facing the bagua bronze mirror, an inexplicable force envelopes them. Lu Yue's body stiffens, and she lowers her head. The tall young man stares directly at the Bagua mirror. His gaze blank, but unnoticed by others, a flash of blue light briefly sparks in the depths of his pupils, though no anomaly appears on the mirror. Where are you from? What brings you to the city? A middle-aged male city guard glances at them and asks languidly. Kind sirs, we are siblings from Liojia town, three hundred miles northwest of the city. My name is Lu Yue, and this is my elder brother Lu Shi. We have come to the city to seek relatives and also to treat my brother, Lu Yue says with a smile, speaking quickly. Over the years, although she and the tall young man have depended solely on each other, they still occasionally interact with outsiders. To make things easier, she has given her stone brother, the name Lu Shi. While speaking, Lu Yue quickly hands over some copper coins to the guard, slightly more than the required entry fee. The middle-aged guard, seeing the extra coins, smiles satisfactorily, discreetly pocketing the extra money and giving another glance at the somewhat vacant-looking tall young man, Lu Shi, then waves them through. You two don't look like troublemakers. Go ahead. Lu Yue responds and quickly pulls Lu Shi into the city. They walk a good distance from the gate and only slow down in a secluded corner, letting out a sigh of relief. Thankfully I still have the chi-drawing talisman dad gave me, which conceals my demonic aura, or the demon-revealing mirror would have detected it. Lu Yue checks to make sure no one is watching and mutters under her breath before pulling a green jade talisman from her bosom. The talisman, two inches long and two fingers wide, is engraved with green patterns forming a complex array with gentle green light flowing over it like water. She looks at the talisman in her hand, a trace of sadness flashing in her eyes before she carefully tucks it away again. Turning a couple of corners, they arrive at the main street of Mingyuan City. The street is wide enough for three carriages to drive abreast, lined with large and spacious shop buildings on both sides, stretching into the distance. Buildings here are mostly made of wood rather than brick, and although the structures aren't very tall, rarely over thirty feet, their intricate and novel designs are quite fascinating. This being Lu Yue's first visit to such a large city like Mingyuan, the bustling crowd around her makes her slightly afraid, and she sticks close to Lu Shi. Although the crowd is dense, everyone goes about their own business, and no one interferes with them, allowing her to gradually relax and become fascinated by the various novelties around, pulling Lu Shi along excitedly on the street. Stone brother, look over there. I've heard about that. It looks really delicious, Lu Yue says, unable to take her eyes off a vendor selling candied haws nearby. Lu Shi's dark eyes reflect the bustling scene around him. His expression uninterested and indifferent. Just as Lu Yue is about to pull him toward the vendor, she notices his indifferent demeanor and feels a wave of disappointment. She quickly remembers the purpose of their city visit and tightens her grip on his hand, speaking earnestly. Stone brother don't worry. With such a big city, there must be a doctor who can cure you. Lu Shi's gaze flickers slightly in response. After casually eating at a roadside stall, they ask around and soon find the locations of two nearby medical halls. 
To the west of the city lies Lee's Medical Hall. Lee's Medical Hall has been practicing medicine in this area for a hundred years and is considered a heritage brand. A middle-aged man in a blue cloth robe sits on a wooden chair, pressing three fingers on Lou Schur's wrist to feel his pulse. Lou er stands by, somewhat nervous. This middle-aged man, named Li Chongqing, is the current successor of Lee's Medical Hall, a renowned local medical expert with over twenty years of experience. After a long moment of pulse reading, Li Chongqing withdraws his hand. Your brother's pulse is smooth and powerful, his vitality is strong, and his body seems to be in excellent condition. How could he have contracted aphasia? When did this condition appear? Was there any external cause? Li Chongqing frowns and asks, My brother and I have been separated for many years, I have no knowledge of his condition. Lu Yue shakes her head. That makes it difficult. Without knowing the cause, there's no way to treat it. Forgive my limited medical knowledge, I'm powerless here. Li Chongqing strokes his beard, appearing apologetic. Is there really no clue at all? Liu Yue asks anxiously. I truly am powerless. Li Chongqing shakes his head. Disappointed, Liu Yue bows to Li Chongqing and leaves the medical hall with Liu Shi. There are many more medical halls in Mingyuan City. We'll visit them one by one, and surely we'll find a cure for you. The girl feels disheartened for a moment, but soon lifts her spirits and speaks encouragingly to Liu Shi. Liu Shi grins, not entirely comprehending Liu Yue's words. The two head in a direction, passing through two streets to another medical hall. This medical hall, with its gray walls and black-tiled roof, has a wide entrance and exudes a sense of luxury, much more imposing than Lee's medical hall, and quite a few people are seeking treatment there. This medical hall is so large, the doctors inside must be more skilled, Lu Yue says, full of hope as she pulls Lu Shi inside. Half an hour later they emerge, the girl's face still marked by disappointment. Don't worry, there are other medical halls, Lu Yue quickly rallies. For the rest of the day, they roam the streets, visiting nearly all the medical halls in Mingyuan City, but the doctors are all at a loss regarding Lu Shi's condition. To the north of the city, wild chrysanthemum medical hall, two figures slowly walk out, Lu Yue and Lu Shi. Lu Yue looks downcast, fiddling with the corner of her clothing. Although not the largest, Wild Chrysanthemum Medical Hall is reputed for its doctor's insights into complicated diseases, but unfortunately, they also couldn't determine Lu Shi's condition. Young lady, wait a moment, a voice calls from behind just then, as a gray-haired elder in a green robe hurries after them. Dr. Lu, Lu Yue stops, slightly surprised. This green-robed elder, who had just examined Lu Shi, is the attending physician at Wild Chrysanthemum Medical Hall. Have you perhaps thought of something about my brother's condition? Lu Yue suddenly feels hopeful and quickly asks. Indeed, after examining your brother, I went to the back hall to consult some medical books and by chance, I saw a case similar to your brother's condition. The elder nods gravely. Please tell me. Lu Yue responds eagerly. According to the records, your brother's symptoms are quite unlike typical aphasia. Rather, it seems he is either cursed or under some sort of restraint that has damaged his spirit. Such injuries cannot be treated by ordinary doctors, only by masters proficient in spiritual matters. As for his inability to speak, that is a minor issue. If his spirit is healed, he will naturally be able to speak again, the elder continues. Hearing this, Lu Yue falls silent, and after a long moment, she manages a faint smile. Thank you, Dr. Lu, for your guidance. Young lady, you are too polite. It is our duty as physicians to save lives. The elder shakes his head and returns to the building. Lu Yue leads Lu Shi out of Wild Chrysanthemum Medical Hall, feeling downcast. Ah, it turns out Stone Brother's spirit has indeed been harmed, the girl murmurs to herself. Being a fox spirit, though young, she has some understanding of cultivation and had guessed from Lu Shi's unusual symptoms that his spirit might have been damaged. To treat him, they must seek help from cultivators skilled in spiritual matters. Such cultivators are immensely powerful, and with only an amulet to protect her, she is unsure she can deceive them. 
Their visit to Mingyuan City was a last-ditch effort, hoping against hope that she was wrong, but it seems that is not the case. Liu Yue'e hesitates. As she broods, a commotion suddenly erupts on the street ahead, and the crowd becomes chaotic. The horse is spooked. Get out of the way. Shouts come from ahead as people scatter in panic. Nearby, a silver carriage is being pulled by a scale-covered green beast that has gone berserk, charging directly towards Lu Yuer and Lu Shur. The green beast bellows wildly, and the carriage bounces wildly behind it, the driver white-faced and desperately pulling at the reins to no avail. Lu Yuer, alarmed, pulls on the young man, trying to get out of the way, but it's too late. In a gust of foul wind, the beast, pulling the carriage, charges to within a few yards of them, the girl even able to see the beast's bared fangs and the foam flying from its mouth. Chapter 6 The Youth in White Robes Ah! Lu Yuer was about to cast a spell to block the crazed green horse, but her nervousness caused her mana to falter, and she couldn't help but cry out in alarm. At the critical moment, she saw only darkness before her eyes as Lu Shur suddenly stepped forward, positioning his tall frame in front of her and extending his hand like lightning to grasp the horse's thick neck. He then collided with the green horse. With a loud crash, the green horse, as if it had hit a wall, came to a sudden halt, its massive body stopped in its tracks. The force was so great that the cobblestones on the street were shattered by its iron hooves. The silver carriage, propelled by inertia, hit the rear of the horse and flew sideways for several yards before crashing heavily to the ground. Although the carriage did not flip over, it was badly damaged, scattering its contents across the ground. The driver, unable to keep his seat, nearly fell off. Lu Shur, immovable as if nailed in place, remained unshaken. The nearby crowd witnessing this was dumbfounded, and someone from a tea house exclaimed in admiration, What strength! Lu Yuer patted her chest in relief, looking with a slight warmth in her heart at the tall figure who had protected her. Over the past few years, whenever she faced danger, Stone Brother would instinctively step forward like this. Their relationship had long since surpassed that of kin. With Lu Shur blocking it, the green horse became even more agitated. It lowered its head and rammed its massive skull into Lu Shur's chest. Be careful, Stone Brother. Liu Yue'e exclaimed in alarm. Lu Shur, expressionless, increased the pressure on the horse's neck, pressing down. With a thud, the horse's legs bent, and its enormous body was forced to kneel, cracking the cobblestones around it. It seemed as if it was pinned by a mountain, its frame almost collapsing and its eyes showing fear. As the horse, far stronger than itself, finally calmed down under Lu Shur's grip, it lay on the ground, too frightened to move. What strength! The force of that horse's charge must have been at least four or five thousand jean, and yet this man stopped it effortlessly. Amazing! Whose carriage is this, racing through the city streets? If not for this strong man stopping it, who knows how many would have been hurt? The crowd finally began to react, discussing animatedly. Lu Shur then expressionlessly released his arm and stood still. Though free of restraint, the green horse still lay gasping on the ground, daring not to rise. Stone brother, are you all right? Lu Yuer hurriedly checked Lu Shur for injuries and sighed in relief upon seeing him unharmed. The driver, pale as a ghost, now seeing the horse subdued, collapsed weakly onto the carriage. Just then the door of the carriage swung open and two pale-faced young men jumped down. The leader was a twenty-something-year-old man dressed in a pale scholar's robe, handsome in appearance. The other appeared only seventeen or eighteen, with a face like beautiful jade, clear eyes, and dressed in a pristine white robe with a jade belt and a crown set with a large pearl, far outshining his companion in elegance. You dog slave, how did you drive? You almost killed me. The scholar in robes, his face still showing fear, snatched the whip from the driver and began to beat him mercilessly. The driver, his back marked with bloody stripes, did not dare to dodge and kept kowtowing and begging for mercy. Seeing this, the scholar's anger grew, and he whipped even faster. Stop it! He's from the U residence. It's none of our business, better not to say more. 
The nearby chatter ceased instantly as everyone recognized the two men and became subservient in their gaze, obviously familiar with their identities. Brother let it be. It's not his fault. The Qing Feng horse is, after all, a low-tier demon beast, naturally untamable. A hand suddenly reached out, stopping the scholar's wrist and preventing the whip from falling. It was the younger man in the white robe, whose voice was as clear and melodious as dripping water. The scholar glanced at the youth in white, twitched his lips, then snorted and threw the whip aside. Thank you, young Master Qi. The driver bowed repeatedly to the youth in white. Get up. Here, take this money and compensate those hurt by the carriage in the shops. Handle this well, and your punishment will be lessened. The youth in white handed a bag to the driver. Yes, yes, the driver nodded repeatedly, taking the money and heading towards those injured by the accident. Thanks to this gentleman for subduing the Qing Feng horse. It's a small matter if we brothers were injured, but if others were hurt, it would have been unforgivable. The youth in white then turned to Lu Shur and bowed with a smile. The scholar also glanced at Lu Shur, noting his plain appearance and dark skin, dressed in a simple green robe that seemed somewhat shabby. His expression showed a trace of disdain and some reluctance as he also bowed. Lu Shur looked on indifferently, saying nothing. The scholar, unaccustomed to being ignored, was about to explode in anger but was stopped by the hand of the youth in white. The youth studied Lu Shur carefully, noticing something unusual in his eyes, and his interest was piqued. As more people gathered, Lu Yue felt increasingly uneasy and whispered, Stone brother, let's go. The youth in white noticed Lu Yue for the first time, and his eyes lit up when he saw her doll-like delicate face. He quickly stepped forward to block their way, saying, Please wait a moment. What do you want? Lu Yue stopped, her eyebrows furrowed, her face showing a trace of fierceness. My name is Yu Qi. Just now, our carriage was out of control and almost injured you both. I am truly sorry, the youth in white said with a smile. We're fine now please move aside, Lu Yue replied tersely. Thanks to this gentleman's help today, I would feel uneasy if I didn't repay him in some way. We are not far from the Yu residence. May I invite you both to my place to sit for a while, so I can offer some hospitality? Yu Qi spoke slowly. No need. The incident just now was nothing, and we have urgent matters to attend to. Lu Yue shook her head decisively, pulling Lu Shi to bypass the man in front of her. Wait, the urgent matter. Is it perhaps to seek medical treatment for your brother? Yu Qi quickly blocked them again and looked at the tall young man, then asked seriously. How? How did you know about that? Lu Yue was startled, showing a shocked expression. I have a very sensitive nose. You both carry a slight scent of medicinal herbs, likely from just coming out of the nearby wild chrysanthemum pavilion. Although this gentleman is impressively strong, it seems his intellect is impaired, hence my guess. It looks like I was right, Yu Qi said, glancing at the wild chrysanthemum pavilion nearby smiling in a way that revealed a rare charm. Even Lu Yue, a young woman herself, was momentarily dazzled, but she quickly glanced at Lu Shi and seeing that her stone brother remained expressionless, felt strangely relieved. The youth in white then collected his stunning smile and continued, Little sister, our Yu family has some influence here in Mingyuan City and knows quite a few renowned doctors. If it's about seeking medical help, we might be able to assist. That's right, we came to Mingyuan City to seek medical treatment, but ordinary doctors can't treat my brother. Lu Yue still shook her head. It seems your brother's condition is not simple. But no worries, our Yu family has a guest sage who is an expert in medicine, far beyond ordinary worldly doctors. Why not let him take a look at your brother? Yu Qi first frowned, but after looking at Lu Shi and Lu Yue again, he smiled and made his suggestion. A sage. Lu Yue's eyes lit up, slightly hesitant. Please don't refuse. Let me offer a little help. Not to boast, but although there are other sages in Mingyuan City, none can match the medical expertise of the one in our Yu residence, Yu Qi said confidently. All right, we can go with you. But if this sage cannot cure my brother, we will have to leave immediately, Lu Yue finally agreed, swayed by Yu Qi's last statement. 
Of course. By the way, may I have your names? Yu Qi, pleased with her agreement, quickly asked. Lu Yue hesitated, then gave their names. So it's Miss Yue and Brother Lu Shi. Yu Qi nodded repeatedly. Qi, how can you bring strangers home so carelessly, and even ask a true sage to treat him? The scholar in robes, having been ignored for a while, looked displeased and finally spoke up. Don't worry, I have my reasons. Big brother, there's no need for concern. Yu Qi waved his hand dismissively. The scholar seemed somewhat intimidated by his younger brother Yu Qi. He moved his lips as if to say more but ultimately remained silent. At this moment, several brightly dressed guards with swords rushed over from a distance in a hurry. The onlookers, seeing them, quickly dispersed, seemingly quite afraid of these guards. The guards did not pay attention to the bystanders and hurriedly bowed to Yu Qi and his companion. Young masters, we are late, please punish us, they said. We're fine, no need for a fuss. Take the carriage back first, and let's not make a big deal out of this, Yu Qi said lightly. Yes, the guards replied obediently, quickly led the green horse away, and quickly departed. This way please, the youth in white, having handled the situation, smiled at Lu Yue and Lu Shi and led the way. Lu Yue looked again at Lu Shi, tightened her grip on his hand, and followed Yu Qi. The scholar in robes watched them walk away his expression growing darker. After standing still for a moment, he stomped his foot, huffed, and followed them. Ah uh ah, -uh, interesting. She must be the one with decent cultivation potential, the one that the Prime Minister of Fongwa planned to send to the cold flame sect with great effort, said a black-clothed youth at an inconspicuous corner of the street, watching Yu Qi and the others leave. His eyes were narrow, and his face bore an indescribable malice. Junior brother, be careful. It's said that the Yu residence has more than one loose cultivator, and they should not be underestimated. Another person, a gaunt man in grey, stood behind the black-clothed youth, hanging several bulging leather pouches at his waist, also watching the departing figures of Yu Qi and others, then slowly spoke. Senior brother Fan, I know what I'm doing. This mission at the Yu residence is my first test. You were sent to assist me, and unless it's necessary, there's no need for you to act. I can handle everything myself, the black-clothed youth replied nonchalantly. Seeing this, the grey-clothed man smiled bitterly and said no more. He was well aware of his junior brother's temperament. Although not highly skilled in cultivation, he had relatives among the elders in the sect and never regarded his peers highly. As they talked, the two figures blurred and then disappeared from the spot. Chapter 7. The Yu Residence. The youth in white was quite talkative, sharing various interesting stories about the city as they walked, but Lu Yue was somewhat distracted and responded only briefly. The group passed through several streets and soon arrived at the central area of Mingyuan City. Here the environment was quieter, the roads cleaner, and there were no shops on either side, only large residences spaced closely together clearly the dwellings of the city's noble families. After walking a bit further, they arrived at a large red residence. Unlike other buildings in the city, this mansion covered a vast area. Its two-story red gates exuded a majestic aura, and two large stone lions flanked the entrance, each about three meters tall. The doors were adorned with shining brass studs that glittered in the sunlight. On either side of the gate stood a guard in bright armor, similar to those seen earlier but holding long spears and standing solemnly. Everything about the place highlighted the status and power of its owner. A large gilded plaque hung above the gate, bearing the golden characters for Yu Residence. Lu Shi glanced up at the Yu Residence but soon averted his gaze. Lu Yue was amazed by the mansion in front of her, feeling somewhat intimidated. Such a grand residence was unlike anything she had seen before and from the grandeur of the gate, it was clear that the Yu family held a very high status in Mingyuan city, possibly linked to the imperial court of Fonghua. What's wrong, Miss Lu? The youth in white noticed something and asked gently. The Yu residence is really large, and there are so many guards. It's no ordinary family, right? Lu Yue replied with a forced smile. You are very observant, Miss Lu. 
My father is indeed the Prime Minister of Fongwa, which is why we have guards around the residence. Otherwise, how could we afford to have a true sage residing with us? Yu Qi replied nonchalantly. Lu Yuer widened her eyes in surprise. Seeing this, the youth in the scholar's robes displayed a proud expression. Master Qi, Master Er. As they approached, the two guards at the door quickly came forward to greet them, bowing deeply. Yu Qi nodded slightly to them and led Lu Yuer and Lu Shi through the gate. Qi, you insist on bringing outsiders into our home. Be careful if father finds out and becomes furious. Don't say I didn't warn you. The youth in the scholar's robe scoffed and left with a flick of his sleeve after they entered the Yu residence. Ignore him. Please come with me. Yu Qi smiled gracefully and led Lu Yuer and Lu Shi in another direction within the mansion. The Yu residence was vast, with pavilions, towers, and gardens everywhere. The ground was paved with high-quality white and green jade, smooth as mirrors and hard as iron, showcasing the luxury of a wealthy family. Yu Qi seemed to command great respect within the Yu residence. The servants they passed bowed deeply, some even kneeling on one knee. Lu Yuer noticed this and glanced at Yu Qi's back, her bright eyes spinning as she wondered about something. Following Yu Qi, they attracted considerable attention, especially Lu Shi, whose unusual demeanor caught many eyes. However, it seemed that out of respect for Yu Qi's authority, nobody dared to stare. Soon, they reached a corridor where a tall maid in a green dress approached. Young master, you've returned, she said, running over with a joyful smile. Xiao Wu, mind your manners. We have guests, Yu Qi chided her sternly. Xiao Wu stuck out her tongue playfully, not seeming afraid, unlike the other servants. Yu Qi glanced helplessly at Xiao Wu before instructing her. Xiao Wu, you've come at a good time. These two are distinguished guests I've invited, Miss Lu Yuer and Master Lu Shi. Prepare a courtyard in the west wing for them to rest. Xiao Wu then noticed Yu Qi's guests. Lu Shi's wooden expression surprised her, but her eyes lit up when she saw Lu Yuer. Wow, such a pretty young lady. Miss Lu is my honored guest. You must not be rude. Yu Qi scolded, then turned to apologize to Lu Yuer and Lu Shi. Got it, Xiao Wu said, but as Yu Qi turned away, she playfully made a face at Lu Yuer. Lu Yuer was amused and chuckled, quickly covering her mouth with her hand, but the nervous tension she had felt eased slightly. By the way, I've been outside these past few days. Has anything? Yu Qi glanced around and whispered to Xiao Wu as they leaned close, their demeanor intimate. Xiao Wu appeared unbothered by the closeness. Lu Yuer watched this with a slight pout, her fledgling fondness for the young man in white waning somewhat. After a brief exchange, Xiao Wu nodded and quickly walked away. Please follow me, Yu Qi said, continuing to lead the way. They arrived at a small courtyard shortly after where Xiao Wu was waiting. Despite being called a small courtyard, it was quite spacious, with a pebbled path flanked by a green pine on one side and a cluster of lush bamboo on the other. The breeze rustled through the pine and bamboo leaves, creating a serene atmosphere. The furnishings inside were simple but exquisitely crafted. The table and chairs were impeccably clean, clearly freshly tidied. You both must be tired. Rest here for now, and I'll prepare a dinner later to welcome you. The youth in white turned to Lu Yuer and smiled. There's no need for that. I just want to know when the sage can see my brother. Lu Yuer looked around. If you don't enjoy formalities, I'll have Xiao Wu bring dinner later. As for the sage, I'm afraid you'll have to wait until tomorrow to meet him. Yu Qi said after a moment's thought. Alricht, Liu Yuer responded, slightly disappointed. If there's anything else you need, feel free to ask Xiao Wu. Rest well for now, I'll take my leave, Yu Qi said, then looked at Liu Shi once more before departing. Liu Yu nodded. Hermann Elshu. Master, who are these people? They look like ordinary folk. Why are you so courteous to them? Xiao Wu asked curiously outside the courtyard. What do you know, little girl? Today when our carriage was frightened, it was Lu Shi who subdued the Qing Feng horse with one hand and stopped the carriage. Yu Qi playfully pinched Xiao Wu's chin and chuckled. 
The Qing Fong horse, with one hand, that Lu sure. Such strength, Xiao Wu was astonished. Now you see, such a man of extraordinary strength could be very useful to me if I could gain his loyalty. And Miss Lu, when she's older, will certainly be a stunning beauty. How could I let her suffer hardships outside? Naturally, I must bring them both into our household. Make sure they are well treated and don't let them feel neglected, the youth in white said, smiling as he walked away, giving orders. Yes, Xiao Wu, her face flushed, quickly agreed. Inside the courtyard house, after a day of walking and the recent ordeal, Lu Yue felt tired. She pulled Lu Shi into the bedroom to rest. Although they were male and female, they had been living and eating together outdoors for years, so Lu Yue didn't find it inappropriate. As night fell, Xiao Wu brought a lavish dinner. Looking at the table full of delicious food, Lu Yue couldn't help but salivate. She had never eaten such a feast. And although she was in a strange environment, she couldn't resist indulging herself. Lu Shi, however, showed little interest in the food. The night deepened, and a full moon slowly rose. Lu Yue lay in bed, tossing and turning, unable to sleep as she thought about the upcoming doctor's visit. Stone brother, do you think the sage can cure you? Lu Yue moved closer to the edge of the bed and spoke softly. Lu Shi sat meditating by the bed as he had every night for years, never lying down to sleep. He remained expressionless and unresponsive, as if he hadn't heard her. Stone brother don't worry. If the sage here can't cure you, we'll go somewhere else. There must be someone who can, Lu Yue reassured him, then smiled contentedly and slowly closed her eyes, drifting off to sleep. Lu Shi remained still, like a statue in the darkness. After a long while, he suddenly opened his eyes and looked in a certain direction within the Yu residence, instinctively reaching up to touch a dark green ornament under his neck. At the same time, in a secret chamber beneath the Yu residence, the walls were etched with dark red runes converging towards the center. In the middle of the room, a black cauldron stood on a fire pit, its flames roaring. The cauldron emitted a black light and its lid trembled as if it might fly off at any moment. An elderly man stood beside the cauldron, his face tense as he watched. He wore a lotus crown and a grey and white Taoist robe. His eyes were deep-set, his cheeks gaunt, and a long white beard hung from his chin, giving him an air of otherworldly wisdom, though he appeared to be quite aged. Suddenly, a muffled explosion came from the cauldron followed by the smell of something burning. The Taoist's face turned pale. He quickly cast a spell to extinguish the fire, then reached into the still-hot cauldron. His expression darkened as he pulled out a handful of charred powder. The rich scent of medicine mixed with a burnt smell emanated from the powder. Seeing this, the Taoist's face turned ashen, and he began to curse angrily, stomping his feet in frustration. Chapter 8 the sage by sure. Early the next morning, footsteps echoed outside the west wing of the Yu residence. Walking through the vermilion corridor towards the guesthouse were three people. Leading the group were two figures side by side. One an elderly Taoist clad in a grey and white robe with a lotus crown, and the other a spirited young woman in light yellow palace attire. Behind them followed a maid carrying a three-tiered food box made of sandalwood and lacquered in vermilion. The old Taoist walked with his hands clasped behind his back, his white eyebrows slightly furrowed, displaying a hint of displeasure as he stared ahead, his thoughts elsewhere. The young woman in palace attire seemed about seventeen or eighteen years old. Although her figure was not yet fully developed, she appeared very well proportioned. Her black hair was pulled up high, and her features were clear and beautiful, exuding a valiant aura. Her bright eyes were particularly striking, making her seem otherworldly. A light touch of makeup added a suitable flush to her already fair complexion, enhancing her charm. I'm really sorry to disturb your alchemy, Sage by Sure, the young woman said as they walked, her eyes slightly lowered. It's no bother to take a look, but I'm puzzled, Miss Chi. Why would you want an old Taoist like me to treat a simple minded mortal? The old Taoist replied his expression still neutral. 
You may not be aware, but this person yesterday. The young woman smiled lightly and briefly recounted how Lu Shi had heroically stopped the horse in the street the day before. As the old Taoist listened, rubbing his fingers together, his eyebrows raised slightly upon hearing that Lu Shi had stopped the rampaging Qing Feng horse with just one hand. Since he has shown kindness to Miss Qi, then he is indeed worthy of my attention, the Taoist concluded, relaxing his fingers and speaking indifferently. The young woman smiled and bowed slightly in response. The maid behind them looked a bit nervous, carefully carrying the food box, following the rules strictly and remaining silent. Inside the West Wing, Lu Yue, who had already dressed and washed, was chatting with Lu Shi, who was sitting on the edge of the bed, when they heard a gentle knock on the door. Miss Yue, our young lady has brought the sage to visit you. The maid spoke softly before waiting for a response, approaching the door to knock lightly. Lu Yue stood up but hesitated before answering the door, asking, Your young lady is? It's me, Miss Yue, came a familiar voice from outside. Recognizing the voice, Lu Yue blinked in confusion. She hesitated for a moment before finally opening the door. As she opened the door, a faint medicinal scent greeted her, and she saw the three figures standing outside. Her gaze swept over the old Taoist, identifying the source of the medicinal smell, then moved to the maid, who she recognized as Xiao Wu, the personal maid of Master Qi from yesterday. When her eyes finally rested on the young woman in yellow, who was smiling gently, she gasped in surprise. Your Master Qi, Liu Yue -e exclaimed. That's right. You can call me Miss Qi or Qi Jia, the young woman replied with a smile. No wonder I felt something off about Master Qi yesterday. Liu Yue laukied softly. Off in what way? Qi raised her eyebrows slightly. A bit. Unlike a man, Liu Yue replied diplomatically after a moment's thought. Assuming a male identity makes it easier to avoid unnecessary trouble when traveling. You'll understand when you're a bit older, the woman explained, smiling at Lu Yue's youthful face. Lu Yue nodded, somewhat understanding, and then invited the visitors inside. Miss Yue, this is the sage I mentioned to you, by Shi Zhenren. Master Bai, this is Lu Yue, and the young man over there is her brother Lu Shi. Qi introduced, stepping aside to give the Taoist room. Greetings, Master Sage, Lu Yue said, guessing a little about what was to come. She bowed deeply, not daring to make eye contact with the old Taoist. Lu Shi sat motionless on the bed edge, staring blankly at the newcomers. Sage Bai Shi glanced briefly at Lu Yue before turning his attention to Lu Shi. He walked up to him, circled around, and inspected him from head to toe before finally fixing his gaze on Lu Shi's forehead. After a moment, the sage closed his eyes, raised his hand, and suddenly pointed his fingers towards Lu Shi's forehead. Ah! Lu Yue startled and cried out as the sage's fingers extended. The sage's hand stiffened, and he turned back with a displeased look at Lu Yue. Miss Yue, the sage is just examining your brother. There's no need to panic. Qi quickly reassured and pulled Lu Yue aside. I'm sorry, Master Sage. I didn't mean to. Liu Yue quickly apologized. The old Taoist's expression softened a bit, and he raised his hand again, closing his eyes and pointing at Lu Shi's forehead once more. A green light illuminated Lu Shi's forehead, radiating outward in ripples like a stone thrown into a lake. After a moment, the sage made a soft hum sound, withdrew his fingers, and slowly opened his eyes. How is it? Can my brother be healed? Liu Yue e Iagali asked. The sage glanced at her and then turned to Qi, pulling her aside and whispering something. Qi nodded in response, her expression serious. Liu Yue watched, a mix of anticipation and concern on her face. Feeling Liu Yue's gaze, Liu Shi turned to look at her swallowed the pastry in his mouth, and managed a slight smile. The sage seemed to come to a decision after a pause. He flipped his hand, and an ancient bronze mirror appeared. With a command, the mirror floated above Lu Shi's head, shimmering with a green light that grew clear. Lu Yue watched nervously as vague images seemed to emerge within the light, but after a while, the images remained indistinct. 
seeming displeased, the sage waved his robe, and the mirror whirled back to him, disappearing into his sleeve. What's wrong? Can it be cured? She asked urgently. It's difficult. His soul is sealed for some reason, and reopening it will not be easy, the sage said, hesitating. I can try to set up a soul-calling formation, but it requires privacy and intense focus. Can I stay with him during the treatment? Louis Ware asked after a moment of hesitation. Why would you stay? You'll just be in the way. Don't you trust me? The sage replied sharply. Louis Ware jumped, then quickly waved her hands. Of course not, Master Sage. I just wanted to be with my brother. I promise not to disturb you. As you wish. Preparing the formation will take some time. I'll go prepare, the sage said before leaving abruptly. After the sage left, Chi did not stay long either. She comforted Lu Yuer not to worry too much about her brother's condition, and ensured her comfort in the residence before departing with Xiao Wu. Chapter 9 The Formation On the afternoon of the third day, the maid Xiao Wu came to the West Wing Room to inform Lu Yuer and her brother that Sage Bai Shi was ready to begin treatment for Lu Shi. Under Xiao Wu's guidance, Lu Yuer led Lu Shi through several corridors and courtyards, passing through a circular archway to finally reach the rear yard of the Yu residence. As they traversed the intricately twisting pathways of the residence, Lu Yuer marveled at the layout. But it was the sight of a small lake covered in verdant lotus leaves in the backyard that truly brought home the vastness of the Yu estate to her. Although called a small lake, it was, in reality, hundreds of yards across, a significant body of water compared to the pond she was familiar with. Miss Yuer, over there is where Sage Bai Shi practices his alchemy and meditation. Xiao Wu pointed to a small island in the middle of the lake. Following her finger, Lu Yuer noticed a winding white jade bridge that snaked through the lotus leaves to the island. The island itself was not large, but it was dense with trees and shrouded in mist, giving it a mysterious allure. Thinking about the possibility of her brother Shi being cured there, she couldn't hide her excitement though her heart was also filled with fluctuating emotions. Only Sage by Shur is allowed to meditate there. It's not a place for us servants. From here you'll go on your own, Xiao Wu explained with a giggle, seeing Lu Yuer's distraction. Thank you, Sister Xiao Wu, Lu Yuer quickly thanked her. Pleased by Lu Yuer's sweet call of sister, Xiao Wu cheerfully waved her hand and left. Lu Yuer looked at the misty island and, with a hand on the stone railing of the bridge, hesitated before crossing. An unexpected thought crossed her mind. If Brother Shur's illness is cured, will he leave me? This thought made her momentarily fearful of losing him, but a look at Lu Shur's familiar face reassured her. Brother Shur let's go, she said, stepping onto the bridge and leading him toward the island. They crossed the stone bridge surrounded by the green leaves each step bringing Lu Yuer closer to nervous anticipation. Lu Shi seemed calm, occasionally distracted by the koi fish popping up under the lotus leaves. When they reached the island, the mist seemed less dense than it appeared from afar, and the quietness added to the place's eerie beauty. At the end of the bridge, they followed a cobblestone path that wound its way deeper into the island to an ancient Daoist temple. Sage Bai Shi was waiting at the temple gate and led them through the temple to a courtyard where a large rockery was located. Approaching a section of the rockery, Sage Bai Shi pressed a spot on the rock, and a heavy stone door slowly opened, revealing a tunnel that they entered. Once inside, the stone door closed behind them with a thud. The cave was clearly man-made, slightly larger than their west wing room, with walls lined with lamps burning in odorless oil. At the center of the cave floor was an intricately carved octagonal symbol, different from typical Bagua symbols, containing bizarre animal figures and peculiar lines which seemed to form ancient seal characters. Stop gawking and have him sit at the center of the formation, Bai Shi instructed Lu Yuer, who was examining the formation. Yes, she quickly directed Lu Shi to sit in the middle of the formation and reassured him. Brother Shi, you will be fine. I'll stay right here with you. After settling her brother, she stood against the cave wall, watching nervously. Now stay there and don't make a sound or move. Do you understand? Bai Shi sure sternly instructed. Lu Yuer nodded earnestly, 
and Bai Shi began to chant in an obscure tongue, circling the formation and tracing symbols in the air with his fingers. The small flags around the formation emitted bright lights, converging on Lu Shi. As Lu Shi was enveloped by the lights, he suddenly convulsed, his body stiffening. Lu Yue, alarmed but hopeful, watched as strange symbols formed around him and lights gathered in his eyes, turning them eerily golden. Suddenly Bai Shi stopped chanting, flicked his fingers and shouted, Seal! The floating lights around Lu Shi solidified into a golden cocoon, encasing him completely. The temperature within the cocoon dropped sharply, turning the cocoon into a large block of black ice, freezing Lu Shi inside. Stop! What are you doing? Realizing Bai Shi's malicious intent, Lu Yue screamed, forgetting her earlier caution. She rushed towards the formation, pulling out a small tambourine, ready to smash the ice to free her brother. Chapter 10 Crisis Before the girl could use the magical instrument in her hand, the old sage quickly flung his sleeves and uttered the word, Swift. A golden flash shot out, instantly transforming into golden ropes that swiftly entangled and tightly bound the girl. With a thud, Lu Yue lost her balance and tumbled to the ground. Old thief, what exactly are you trying to do? Lu Yue fiercely glared at Sage Bai Shi, struggling intensely, but the golden rope seemed to sense her resistance and tightened further as it shimmered. Ugh! The pain contorted her face, and tears welled up in her eyes, yet she bit her lip to keep from screaming. At this moment, her ears disappeared from the sides of her face, and instead two pointed triangular fox ears emerged from her hair on top of her head. A powerful binding force from the golden rope sealed her internal magic power. Ha, hey, what am I doing? You little fox demon, you thought a mere magical instrument could fool me? Truly wishful thinking. Sage Bai Shi glanced at the girl lying on the ground. His tone cold. You had seen through my identity from the start. The girl's heart sank, but a defiant look remained on her face. Ha, hey, do you still need to worry about that at this point? You were brought into the residence by Miss Chi. The Fox Clan has significant influence in the spiritual realm, and I originally planned to turn a blind eye. But then I discovered this treasure in human form. Sage Bai Shi's gaze shifted back to Lu Shi, frozen within the black ice, his eyes betraying an uncontrollable greed. What? What are you going to do to Brother Shi? Lu Yue asked tremblingly, sensing his intentions. Don't worry, I have no intention of killing your silly brother. He is a once-in-a-century soul with a naturally strong spirit, made even more perfect by his damaged consciousness, which has left him simple and docile. Just a little manipulation with my secret techniques to erase his remaining senses, and I can create a powerful soul puppet, explained Sage by Shur, his face alight with pride. Hearing this, Lu Yue spat blood from her mouth, her eyes flashing madly. Her face turned a terrifying shade of blood red, and she suddenly arched her back, letting out a beastly growl. Her pupils flashed a eerie green, and her body sprouted thick white fur. Each strand of fur shone brilliantly, and was exceptionally tough. She seemed to transform into a white porcupine in an instant, especially her tail, which flickered with white electrical arcs. The white fur bristled and stretched the golden rope slightly. With a shake of her fluffy tail, a brilliant white light burst forth. Whizzing sounds filled the air as countless white hairs shot out like thousands of flying needles, targeting the black ice. Seeking death, Sage Bai Shi turned abruptly, bellowing in anger. He waved his hand, summoning a black oval shield that flew out in a blur of motion, arriving just before the white fur to protect the black ice. The shield expanded several times in size and, combined with a burst of sword energy to form a protective barrier, managed to deflect most of the fur. However, some still penetrated the barrier and struck the black ice, causing it to tremble violently and crack. In that critical moment, the figure of Sage by Shur flickered beside the ice block, and he swiftly waved his hand. A mass of black mist erupted from his sleeves, part of which merged into the black ice, while the rest formed a shield around it. 
The cracks in the ice halted their spread and began to mend rapidly until the ice looked as good as new. Sage Bai Shur breathed a sigh of relief but glared furiously back at Lu Yuer. The girl lay on the ground, her eyes filled with defiance but her body drained of strength. I underestimated you, Sage Bai Shur said coldly, having had to act fast to prevent the ice from being shattered. With a harsh gesture, he summoned a palm-sized black hand that struck Lu Yuer, sending her flying against the cave wall. She spat out a mouthful of blood and slumped to the ground. Covered in blood and disheveled, she looked gravely injured. If not for Sage by Shur's intent to trade her for spiritual stones, she would have been dead from that blow. Brother Shur. Lu Yuer managed to look towards Lu Shur in the ice block, whispering his name before convulsing slightly and falling unconscious. Sage by Shur, without saying another word, threw several talismans around her body. They burst into black light, forming a sphere that enveloped her. After securing Lu Yuer, he turned back to the black ice, his smile returning. Red-robed sage, Gui Yaozi, wait until I create the soul puppet. Then we'll see who can stand against me. Sage by Shur muttered, his face returning to a stern look as he began setting up another formation around the ice block. Humming, a mass of dark light rises from eight talismans, forming an array that lifts the black ice block a foot off the ground. Seeing this, the old sage flips his hand and pulls out a black gourd. The gourd is engraved with a circle of blue runes, emitting a chilling glow, and the sound of liquid churning comes from within. He uncorks the gourd and carefully tilts it to pour out a stream of ink-black liquid, which emits a pungent, rotten smell. This liquid, sparkling with black specks, seems alive as it continuously writhes.